Thank you for taking the time to view this message online. You can connect with us more through our comment section of this video, through our Facebook page, or through our website, nhgj.org. Welcome, my name is Jerry Lovelace, and it's my privilege to be sharing the message with you today. We've been focused on God's faithfulness to us generation to generation. One of the parts I really enjoyed about this series is getting to hear all of the stories of God's faithfulness in the lives of people in our church family. I love hearing testimonies of the goodness of God in such remarkable ways. It's faith building and it's encouraging for us as the body. And best of all, I think it's just such a beautiful expression of worship to the Lord. So maybe during this time, God has been um, reminding you of some faithful things that he has done, his goodness in your life. And maybe you would like to, to share that with someone. I just encourage you to do that. Find a friend or a family member and share those stories. If you'd like to share them with people in our own church body, reach out to us and we'll help you record it in some of the same ways that you've seen, um, seen others do it here. Well, as I mentioned, this is the fourth and last message in a series that's taken us way back through many generations in the Old Testament, 14 to be exact, spanning from Abraham to David. Each story that we've revisited contains a covenant of God between God and a person or a group of people. And covenants, as you know, are serious business. We don't just throw that word around willy-nilly. It takes two parties making a binding promise to each other to work together to reach a common goal. It's both relational and personal. We have a problem though. Mankind is um, who is made in the image of God by a loving creator, had everything we needed to have perfect relationship with him. And God said that it was good, but instead of agreeing with God and submitting to his definition of good, mankind keeps choosing to define good on their own terms, apart from God. It's into this broken family of humanity that we're born, that innate desire to live by our own definition of good is in our hearts from the very beginning. If you don't believe me, just take a look at a couple of examples I found. These pictures are posted by parents of babies and toddlers who were told, no, that's not a good idea. This first slide is this child thought eating a battery for breakfast would be a good idea. This one thought turning off the sun so that his pumpkin could light up would be good. This one thought having a woman's razor would be good. And my personal favorite, this one thought holding his own poop would be good. Well, it makes us laugh, but honestly, the apple doesn't fall far from the family tree. And our idea of what is good can be really just as absurd. Recounting God's faithfulness in spite of our sin nature is important for us to remember. It's necessary for our discipleship to really understand where we come from and the lengths, the great lengths that God has gone to in order to redeem us and bring us back into relationship with him. In fact, these images that you see behind me are from our student ministry area these banners, along with others, create a timeline of remembrance, all pointing to God's faithfulness to bring redemption to those that he loves, including you and me. I'm a big fan of reminiscing. I really love it. My family will tell you 
And I have the bulging garage to prove it. Each of my three children has at least one, if not two or more, keepsake boxes. I have special memories from 30 years as an educator, trips that we've taken, celebrations that we've had, one year on my birthday, I requested to have a home movie night. We dug out all the favorite family footage and laughed and remembered. So I also have, in addition to the scrapbooks and keepsake boxes, I have DVDs with hours of family memories. I don't really see this pattern changing anytime soon since I recently became a grandmother. But I tell you all this because there was a season in my life, years in fact, that I didn't really want to relive past moments. I stopped looking back at the photos. I was cautious and guarded when looking through memory boxes. In fact, I really tried to avoid remembering the past at all because there was pain in looking back and remembering. I didn't always trust that any of the memories I had once treasured were even true anymore. Have you ever felt that way? God's people did. It was into one of those painful, disappointing times for Israel that the prophets speak words of hope that God would one day bring about a new covenant. This time would be different. This new covenant wasn't because the other ones were bad. This one was a contrast between something that had been good but temporary, temporal, and something better. Because unlike the old covenant, this new covenant would be unbreakable and eternal. The anticipation of this eternal covenant brings us to the New Testament where we're introduced to Jesus, the one who would fulfill all the prophetic promises and bring about blessing for all people. Let's pray as we go to the scriptures. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word, for your faithfulness in speaking life-giving promises to us in our barren circumstances like you did with Abraham, for being faithful to be with us and among us, your presence with us as you were with the people of Israel and to reign in our hearts and God, we pray that you would reveal to us, speak to us, and guide us and confirm what you're saying and doing in our midst. I pray that your word would accomplish what you desire it to, that your Holy Spirit would stir us um, in this time, in this generation, that we would hear what you have to say to us about your faithfulness and about living in faithful covenant relationship with you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, let's read from Matthew chapter 1. And if you're nervous at all about me reading all those names, don't be. Um, I'm a teacher, and we're professionals at pronouncing unique names with confidence, even if it's incorrect. So, um, so I'll just keep on going. So this is the genealogy of Jesus Christ from the New King James Version, Matthew chapter 1, verses 1 through 17. It says, The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham begot Isaac, Isaac begot Jacob, and Jacob begot Judah and his siblings. Tamar and Judah begot Perez and Zerah. Perez begot Hezron, and Hezron begot Aram. Aram begot Aminadab, Aminadab begot Nashon, and Nashon begot Salmon. Salmon and Rahab begot Boaz. Ruth and Boaz begot Obed. Obed begot Jesse, and Jesse begot David the king. 
Bathsheba, who had been the wife of Uriah and David, begat Solomon. Solomon begat Rehoboam. Rehoboam begat Abijah. Abijah begat Asa, and Asa begat Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat begat Joram, and Joram begat Uzziah. Uzziah begat Jotham, and Jotham begat Ahaz, and Ahaz begat Hezekiah. Hezekiah begot Manasseh, Manasseh begot Ammon, and Ammon begot Josiah. Josiah begot Jeconiah and his brothers. About this time they were carried away to Babylon. And after they were brought to Babylon, Jeconiah begot Sheltiel, and Sheltiel begot Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel begot Abiud. Abayud begot Elikim, and Elikim begot Azor. Azor begot Zadok, Zadok begot Achim, and Achim begot Eliud. Eliud begot Eleazar, Eleazar begot Mathan, and Mathan begot Jacob, and Jacob begot Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called Christ. So all the generations from Abraham to David are 14 generations from David until the captivity in Babylon are 14 generations. And from the captivity in Babylon until the Christ are 14 generations. Well, jumping right into the New Testament with a long family tree of people who lived thousands of years ago may not seem to everyone the best way to restore hope. It might even sound as exciting to you as an evening watching my home videos, but for a Jew in Jesus' day, however, this genealogy would have grabbed their attention. Viral videos and trending stories of news today would be similar because it would have summed up all of their hopes and expectations about what God had been promising to do in their lives ever since the time of Abraham. And it would have announced that God's plan had come to completion in their own lifetime. Notice verse 11, maybe you did when I was reading, it's a little touchy spot in the genealogy for Jewish readers, reminding them of a part of their story that they may not want to remember. About the time they were carried away into Babylon. Matthew just had to go there, right? This one verse sums up six centuries of anguish and suffering and oppression for God's chosen people. It might have felt like pulling out that one photo from the album that hurt so much to go back and look at. The Babylonian captivity was a tragic shift in Israel's story. All of Israel's hopes surrounding the Davidic kingdom that would have no end seemed to be completely lost. In 586 BC, the Babylonians conquered Jerusalem, destroyed the temple, and carried the people and even their king into the most humiliating exile. And we should remember that this exile wasn't just a painful memory from the distant past, but it was really an abiding reality for the Jews in Jesus' day who continued to feel the effects of this loss. Jewish people continued to suffer oppression under the hands of various foreign nations up to the time of Jesus when the Romans ruled the land. And we should also remember that the end of the kingdom was not simply a military defeat imposed kind of out of left field. It was a consequence, right, of their failure to be covenant keepers for generations, God's prophets had re reminded the people of Israel's strength 
wasn't dependent on military might or economic wealth or political maneuvering, but it was on covenant faithfulness to the one true God. And their own law even taught that if they broke their covenant relationship with Yahweh and entered into idolatry, that they would suffer the consequence of exile. And that's exactly what happened. Matthew's mention of the Babylonian exile would likely have triggered all kinds of emotions, sadness maybe, frustration, disappointment, humiliation, anger, despair, all surrounding even their current suffering and oppression. The genealogy continues, listing two more generations of exiled Davidic descendants up to a man named Zerubbabel in verse 12. It's into this time in history of Israel's history that one of those painful moments in the family album that God addresses the hearts of his people. The remnant was ready to regroup, rebuild, which was a step in the right direction. But we know from generations of failure that the cycle of unfaithfulness was likely to repeat itself. But God, our faithful God, whose mercies never fail us, takes his covenant to a whole new level. The eternal, not the temporal. This was new. This was beyond what they had experienced in the past. God's presence had been among them, but what God wanted to do was dwell in them. This would require a heart transformation. God speaks once again to his people to address the heart issues in order to prepare them to live once again in covenant relationship with him. Well, Babylon had collapsed and the world was now ruled by Persia. In 538 BC, Cyrus, the king of Persia, allowed the exiled Jews to return to Jerusalem after 70 years in exile. The Jews who immigrated from Babylon back to their original homeland faced intense opposition, both external and internal. Ezra chapter 4 speaks of some of the external opposition, and the book of Haggai speaks of some of the internal challenges the people faced. There were, they were challenges that were really not entirely different than the opposition we face in our day. We too have both external and internal opposition to living in covenant relationship with God and with others. Let's look at how God gets to the heart of his people and see what he would say to us in our generation. As I read a section from the book of Haggai to you, this is Haggai chapter 1 coming from the NIV. It says, In the second year of King Darius, on the first day of the sixth month, the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai to Zerubbabel, the son of Sheltiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest. This is what the Lord Almighty says. These people say, The time has not yet come to rebuild the Lord's house. Then the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai, it is, is it time for you yourselves to be living in your paneled houses while, the house, while this house remains in ruins? Now this is what the Lord Almighty says, Give careful thought to your ways. You have planted much but harvested little. You eat but never have enough. You drink but never have your fill. You put on clothes but are not warm. You earn wages only to put them in a purse with holes in it. This is what the Lord Almighty says. Give careful thought to your ways. 
Go up into the mountains and bring down timber. Build my house so that I may take pleasure in it and be honored, says the Lord. You expected much, but see, it turned out to be little. What you brought home, I blew away. Why? declares the Lord Almighty, because of my house, which remains in ruin. While each of you is busy with your own house, See, the work of the Lord had gotten off to a good start. There was excitement and momentum in the beginning. The people rallied together. They got to work to lay the foundation of the temple. They even rebuilt the altar and resumed bringing sacrifices. They sang praises to the Lord, giving thanks to him, saying, He is good. His mercy endures forever. But then it stopped. For 14 years, in fact, the work of rebuilding the temple laid idle. It's not hard to see how this might happen. I mean, the work was difficult. The land had been neglected for 70 years. There was some lack of resources and manpower. But the real issue was that over time, these external obstacles set in motion an internal shift from placing priority on restoring God's house to their own survival and needs. Remember, these were good people. They had made this journey back. They had left what they knew in Babylon. They loved God. They were devoted to him. And if you had asked them why the work stopped, They wouldn't have spoken against the idea of building the temple. It was important to them. Instead, they spoke against the timing. They said, it just isn't a good time right now. This really hits home for me. I do this. I feel like we do this, right? It's... There's so much going on. It's just so crazy right now. This isn't a good time for me. Because of the external obstacles, God's people began to rationalize and decided that it wasn't time to rebuild after all. They gradually drifted into a lifestyle where God's house was no longer the priority. The thing is that placing things, other things, as priority before God is not benign. Allowing the temple to lay in ruins was to neglect the worship of God. And as one theologian, James Boyce, put it, in the final analysis, all inverted priorities are idolatry. The transformation, transformed heart, prepared for eternal and not just the temporal, make sure that God has first place. God says twice in this passage, consider your ways. The Hebrew figure of speech for this phrase literally means, put your heart on your roads. Haggai asked God's people to consider what direction their life was headed and if they really wanted it to continue that way. He's saying, you've been waiting on all the external things around you to change, making it more convenient, more doable, more realistic to put me first, but they won't change. One external opposition may dissipate, but another one will arise. You cannot base whether or not you will be a covenant keeper on externals. Consider your ways. The book of Haggai is largely unique among the books of the Old Testament prophets for one really big reason, and that is the people actually listened. They resumed construction on God's house, and through that physical act of rebuilding the temple, the people began to indicate a shift in their spiritual lives as well, from devotion to self toward devotion to God. 
And God, in his faithfulness, responds. Later in the passage, to the people's obedience by assuring them of his presence and empowering them to do what he had asked them to do. He says he would stir in their hearts, stir the spirit in them. So the temple started to take shape. It started to rebuild and get going, get things back on track. But now there was another opposition cropping up that caused them to feel like maybe giving up, not finishing it. This time, the opposition is internal. I want to read a section from Haggai verse chapter 2, starting in verse 4. It says, Who is left among you who saw this temple in its former glory? And how do you see it now in comparison with it? Is this not in your eyes as nothing? Yet now be strong, Zerubbabel, says the Lord, and be strong, Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and be strong, all you people of the land, says the Lord, and work, for I am with you, says the Lord of hosts. According to the word that I covenanted with you when you came out of Egypt, so my spirit remains among you. Do not fear, for thus says the Lord of hosts, Once more, it is a little while, I will shake heaven and earth, the sea and dry land, I will shake all nations, and they shall come to the desire of all nations, and I will fill this temple with glory, says the Lord of hosts. The silver is mine, the gold is mine, says the Lord of hosts. The glory of this latter temple shall be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts. And in this place, I will give peace, says the Lord of hosts. When Solomon built the first temple, he spared no expense in materials, he hired the best talents that he could find to do the work. The temple that they were rebuilding couldn't match the majesty of that first temple. But comparing the good old days or the Elvis years, um, comparing how others have experienced the work of God in various places and in times, it's not beneficial. I remember some years ago, I watched an interview with the beloved Reverend Billy Graham before his death in 2018. He was, of course, known worldwide as leading thousands to Christ through his crusades. The interviewer was impressed by the statistics and asked Reverend Graham what he thought God would say to him when he met him face to face in heaven. And Billy Graham's reply stuck with me because he said, Well, I hope that I hear him say, Well done, my good and faithful servant. I remember thinking to myself, Well, goodness sakes, if he doesn't say it to Billy Graham, what hope do I have of hearing it? I'll probably never leave thousands to Christ like Billy Graham. But does that mean I guess I just shouldn't bother? That'd be silly, right? But we are so quick to compare and to poo-poo what we can do and what God has asked us to do to be faithful to do. I had to laugh when I was writing this because now I've said the word poop and the word poo-poo in the same message, and you just don't get that kind of edginess with Andy, I'm sure. So, but don't go comparing the two of us. So this internal obstacle of comparison is, um, can be a constant interference for us as well. Go big or go home, we often say. 
Do you ever remember comparing church camp to your youth group back at home or one church to another or one leader to another? Maybe even in your personal life, someone else's marriage or relationships or children or others we perceive as getting what we'd hoped to get. This is another one that hits me right to the core. God is saying, don't get stuck in the mire of comparison. God, who is faithful to give us eternal perspective, reminds his people that a transformed heart prepared for the eternal and not just the temporal is not mired in comparison. Do you know that the temple that they rebuilt in the time of Haggai, Jesus himself worshiped in? generations later. The latter turned out to be, just as God said, imagine that, greater than the former and filled with his glory, God incarnate, Jesus the Christ. Jesus ushered in the new covenant, the culmination of God's saving work in his people. God promises to make an everlasting covenant with his people in which he will write his laws on their transformed hearts, bringing complete forgiveness of sin. He'll put his spirit in them to dwell in them and empower them to love and obey his commands. He will raise up that faithful king to rule and reign in their hearts eternally to bring them back into the land of promise, reunify them into one people of God, and cause them to be a light to the nations. The death and resurrection of Jesus and the outpouring of his spirit were and still are the signs of this new covenant. Maybe today you have never taken that first step to admit that you've been determining to choose what was good for your life apart from God. God loves you, but choosing sin keeps you separated from him. I want you to know that God has made a way to have a personal relationship with him through the death and resurrection of his son, Jesus. Jesus took the consequences of all of our sins on himself so that we could be forgiven and be a part of God's family. He will fill you with his spirit as part of that family and begin a lifelong journey of growing and discipling, being transformed and renewed daily by the power of his spirit in your heart. I invite you to do that today. While this new covenant realities are in many respects already present, it's nevertheless true that the best is still to come when Jesus returns. We want every generation to know and trust the faithfulness of God. We need to be doing the work of discipleship preparing our hearts for the eternal, not just the temporal. Let's not let our priorities become self-focused and neglect our worship of our faithful Father. Let's not get mired down in comparisons. Let's be eagerly anticipating the greater work that God is doing and wants to do and take on the responsibility to build up the body by walking in covenant relationship with God and each other, and passing on that legacy from one generation to the next. One thing I ask the kids upstairs almost every week when we recount the stories from God's word, is what does the story teach us about God's character? Well, as I conclude today, I want to leave you with that same question. What do these covenants and the great lengths to which God will go 
to keep and fulfill them teach us about his character. Take a moment, let the Holy Spirit speak to you about that. Let's pray. God, we thank you that you are faithful, that you are a covenant keeper that you don't turn your back on us, but you continue to persevere with us, to sacrifice for us, to make a way for us to be transformed. So I pray today, Lord, that you would stir our hearts, that your spirit would speak to us in the areas that our heart needs to be transformed into being a covenant keeper. And Lord, I pray that as we do so, that we would pass on from generation to generation that legacy of being your people set apart for whom you dwell with us and in us and that you are continually faithful to. And God, help us to be covenant keepers with you and with each other. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You can find more resources for this service at nhgj.org. Email us your prayer requests to prayer at nh4gj.org. If you are a new follower of Jesus, we have a free resource for you called Following Jesus. To receive a copy, send a request to info at nh4gj.org. If you would like to partner with our ministry through giving, you can do that online at nhgj.org giving or by mail to 641 Horizon Drive, Grand Junction, Colorado, 81506. Thank you for being with us and may the Lord bless you.